Hey everyone, it's Mike Andes, and you're listening to the Business Bootcamp Podcast. Today, I'm going to be revealing all the companies that I currently have stock in on the stock market. I'm going to be actually going through my Robinhood app, going through each company, explaining why I have them, and I hope that it is valuable to you, and regardless if you invest in the stock market or thinking about it in the future, I think this will be of value to you. Before we get into today's show, a big thank you to today's sponsor, which is Gusto. If you haven't already, go to gusto.com slash bootcamp, try out their software completely completely free for 90 days where you can do direct deposits into your employees you know checking account as well as they can have an app where they see the breakdown of where you know their federal taxes are going and all the other deductions that come out of their paycheck it's very very good check it out today go to gusto.com slash boot camp all right so a couple disclosures before um we get into this obviously we have to do this when it comes to investing uh because i invest in a company does not mean you should you should do your own homework you should do your own checks and figure these things out yourself. I'm doing this only for educational purposes so that you can figure out some of the reasoning behind the companies that I invest in and realize that in different stages of your investment career in in terms of age, how much money you have, etc., that's going to change which companies you're going to invest in. It's going to change what type of risk tolerance you have. And so, I'm a big believer that when it comes to the stock market, I'm only, I am only going to invest money that I can lose. So I'm not going to leverage myself. I'm not going to go into what's called margin. Margin is money that you borrow against your account to borrow more than what you, how much cash you actually have in value, how much cash value you have. I don't do that. Um, I usually stay uh, below you know, if I'm using margin, it's only temporarily if there's an incredibly amazing opportunity, but I don't, in general, use margin. Uh, my risk tolerance is somewhat higher because I, I don't have dependents. I, uh, I have a good cash-flowing businesses that I know that if I lost all my money in the stock market, I, there would still be food on my table, kind of you know, using that terminology. Like, I'm not going to go broke because the money's lost. So uh, I don't look at st- the stock market as gambling because the way that I do invest, and that is I look at the numbers. Every single one of these companies, I've looked at their balance sheet. I have looked at their P&L. Um, and I've looked at a, a lot of research in each and every one of these companies. So I don't feel like I'm gambling. However, any and all, any and all of these companies could go to, go to zero. Um, there's no guarantees and with the volatility that the current stock market, the stock market currently has, uh, that is a possibility. Like we could have another stock market crash. So don't go out and invest in these companies because I did. What I hope this does is that if you're wanting to invest down the road in the stock market or into real estate or anything like that, that some of this, the way that I think might help you sort of guide or mold the way that you start to look at potential investments, all right? So I have, if you just, you know, if you're new to the channel, I, the 99% of my time is focused on my businesses. You know, I have real estate and then I have the stock market. The stock market, what's nice about it is it's passive. I don't have to do anything. Like literally besides, you know, looking at, discounted cash flows and, and you know, looking at P&Ls and balance sheets, I don't have to work, right? But the thing is, I would do that stuff anyways because I enjoy it. Um, I enjoy looking at profit and loss statements. I enjoy looking at the numbers. And then because I learn a lot from my businesses just by doing that. So I would do that regardless. But uh, I do invest significantly in the stock market. And I wanted to show you some of the companies that I invest in. So there's quite a few. I'm going to have to go pretty quickly because there's about I think there's about 25 or 30 that I'm invested in. Uh, somewhat you know, uh, diversified. I do not have massive, uh, like I don't have where 50% of my portfolio is in one company. I don't. I think the biggest one is 8%. Yeah, 8%. And then I think uh, most of them are right around, let me see here. I think most, yeah, two of them are 8%. The rest of them are, the majority of them are around 2 to 3%. So like, I might even have 30 companies here. I have, <laughs> we'll have to see. But I'm going to go through them now. Uh, in terms of the returns, um, you know, this year has been really, really good. Obviously, it's 2020. It's been a really great year. Uh, The returns this year on average have been 94.8%. Again, I don't expect this next year or the year after that. Uh, This is a year where I was able to buy a lot in the spring and was pretty risk tolerant and went into recovery stocks like Delta and Norwegian Cruise Lines um, and, uh, Simon Property Group, which is a mall REIT. So, uh, but then I'm I'm 100% out of all of those because I don't believe in their business models long term, especially like a mall. Like it's going to waste if they don't figure out um, 
you know, different business models and strategies. So let me go through these companies without, you know, now you've, we've gone six minutes with a bunch of, of uh, disclosures and fine print. Let me just go through the companies again. Do not just please don't be like, oh, Michael invested in them. I'm going to invest in them. That's not the way you should do your investing. If that's your strategy is listening to one person and then going and investing your money, you are gambling. Okay. You need to do your own research and you figure this out yourself. Okay, so the first company I uh, have, and these are in no particular order in terms of how much more I invest. The one at the very end, I invest more than someone in the middle, for example. So it's, there's not really any sort of rhythm or pattern you're trying to find here about how, which one I invest more in. What I can say is that I have shifted more towards blue chip and high, uh, lower risk companies, but I have a good 20% of more speculative stocks, and you'll see that in here, okay? So... Uh, first company is Adobe. Uh, believe in this company a lot. I feel like they, based upon my projection, should be around six hundred dollars per share. You know, I might not give all of those away because um, uh, people just you know, people react uh, and will buy because of that. But basically, right now they're at five hundred dollars per share. I do see a, a significant amount of upside. Their their balance sheet is incredibly strong. This is much more of a value play because their PE ratio is forty six. So PE ratio is price to earnings ratio. You take the price of the value of the company divided by the earnings you know, that they have in a year, and you get what's called a P.E. ratio. And so a growth stock is going to be a company that is valued based upon the growth and future potential, and whereas a value stock is going to be usually a P.E. ratio that is uh, kind of standard in, ter in terms of the industry. So Adobe, it's been around for a long time. It has a really healthy profit margin, has a really healthy balance sheet, and you know the market cap is $239 million. You divide that up by, by their earnings, and you get 46.16 as of today in terms of the P.E. ratio. So Adobe, that's the first company. Uh, Salesforce is the next one. So I just recently bought into Salesforce because they dramatically dropped after their acquisition of Slack. So they acquired Slack, I think it was like 23 billion or something like that, 24 billion, I forget exactly, sorry. Um, but their stock went down from a high of 281 to 220. And so I bought in significantly on that dip because I feel like a lot of people thought they overpaid for Slack. And I do feel like in the, if you look at right now, they probably overpaid for Slack. But you got to remember that um, this is a, a massive company, Salesforce. They have $206 billion market cap. And they are tapping into Slack, which is a great enterprise software. It's kind of like a messaging software for big companies. And if they get all of that portfolio of contacts, database, that information is so invaluable to them. I feel like Mark Benioff over there is a very smart dude. And he's going to be able to figure out how to take Slack and make it super, super profitable for Salesforce. And so really, though, like the drop was really just a reduction of the hype that went into the sale into the slack uh, acquisition so like everyone thought they were gonna buy slack so it jumped like massive it went from like you know 190 to 280 like in a few days um and then after the acquisition it dropped significantly because people thought they overpaid uh, i feel like there's a lot of opportunity in this one so that's salesforce okay I'm, i gotta go faster or else we're gonna spend I, I could spend an hour on every single one of these companies because i'm pretty excited about them um, all right, the next one is Alibaba. I traditionally do not invest in, in Chinese companies. There's a couple you'll see uh, that I did do. And I recently only invest in these for two reasons. Number one, Alibaba just dropped the other day like 14% due to a, uh, a, this is a little bit of a risk here because in China when they have an antitrust inspection or an antitrust investigation, it actually means something. In the U.S., when they do like an antitrust uh, that's you buy that dip because it ne like they're never going to break up these companies. Uh, it's just political pandering by saying that they should, uh, in my opinion. And so when it comes to China, though, they have power to break up companies. And they they were saying that they have monopolistic type of business practices at Alibaba. And so the the stock dropped like a lot, like I think 14, 15 percent. But more importantly, it was at 312. I think it was like a high of 312. 317. It was at its high of 317, and it dropped all the way down to 220. So it's literally been cut by 35%. So I really feel like it has 40, 50% upside, uh, and it's a big company, but it's a con it's a Chinese company, and you're, there's definitely more risk there because there's certain things that can't that you can't trust a lot of the stuff they say as much as 
a an American company. But um, I feel like there's definitely opportunity there. I was I was I was a little bit in Alibaba, but then after this recent drop, I'm significantly coming into it, especially because of the new administration that's probably going to be coming into the United States uh, in 2021 and beyond. Uh, they're going to be much more friendly with China and Chinese companies. So, all right, I got to go through these a little faster. I know every single one is so exciting, but. All right, the next one is exciting too. Rocket Mortgage. So this one's been bumbling around, basically trading trading sideways for the past like five, six months. Um, but every single dip I've been buying significantly, I do feel like they're on a short squeeze and they're going to eventually rebound very, very significantly. I see this going past 30 within the next year or two. Um, Rocket Mortgage is a company that does online mortgages. They recently IPO'd, they went public basically, and I have a significant amount invested in them. And the reason for that is because I feel like this is an undervalued stock dramatically and is going to eventually be found by a uh, the hedge funds, right? So the same thing that happened with Lemonade, which we'll get into in just a second, um, I think is going to happen to Rocket Mortgage in the next six to 12 months. And that is hedge funds are going to start buying in. They have, are super profitable, extremely profitable. Their market cap is only 2.4. Uh, a lot of people, I think there's apprehension because they think the only reason that they're doing well right now is the low interest rates. But I feel, think like they're failing to realize the technology that market, uh, Rocket Mortgage has in making mortgages really, really accessible online. So their PE ratio is like super, super low compared to anything. Like even if you take the look at this as a value stock, like the amount of money that they're making every single quarter is incredible. Uh, super, super profitable. And I like investing in profitable companies. Um, it's much less risky than companies that are pre-revenue or pre-profit or they're losing money. And so I feel like this is a great small cap, uh, just my opinion. And you're going to have to be patient. It could be six more months before hedge funds and large uh, funds start buying into it. And that will drive the stock market price up very, very quickly. And that is a testament, uh, testament uh, by Redfin. Or not Redfin. I, sorry, that was my next one. I'm jumping down onto Lemonade. So Lemonade is another stock similar to Rocket Mortgage I invested in. This is a more speculative stock. They're still losing money. I think they'll be profitable here pretty soon. But... I was buying this one when it was going, it was trading sideways, it, 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 initial public offering, it, it started off at $50, it spiked up to like 80, I didn't buy it at that peak, I waited till it came back down, and it just traded sideways for a long time, and I, I, I like the technology and the fundamentals of this business, and I like the leadership of the business, and literally in the past month, it has gone up to 130 plus dollars per share, and again, I attributed this to Literally hedge funds finding out about these companies after they've had a six, you know, two to three quarters on, uh, on the record and then buying in. And when a hedge fund goes all in on a company, it just drives the stock market, stock, stock price up through the roof. And so literally it has doubled, if not, no, let's see, it's tripled in the past since uh, two, two months. So two months it has uh, tripled Lemonade. Uh, and so Lemonade is a company that sells insurance and it's very much AI driven. Uh, and so is a lot of technology that goes into be able, basically begin, be able to get renter's insurance uh, and different types of forms of insurance online without having to talk to anyone all through robots. And I feel like, you know, their pet insurance is really high quality. Their renter's insurance is really high quality. And as they be, are able to, to sell in more and more states and more and more territories, as well as add more products like life insurance or home insurance, I feel like they're just going to continue to grow. And that's why they've gone gangbusters the past few months. All right, another company I, I invest in, again, that's been very lucky on is Redfin. My co dollar cost per average is around $40 on this one. Uh, I purchased this early in the pandemic, knowing that people were going to start buying homes online more. And so it did dip, I think, down to like 30, uh, the high 30s there for a bit after I bought it. But then it just took off. The past, again, two months, it's just taken off from 47 up to $78 per share. Redfin is basically online uh, marketplace for real estate. You can sell your house now. I was a little bit skeptical of some, things, some of the things on their balance sheet and the way that they expressed growth, excuse me, uh, because they buy houses. Redfin actually buys houses and then sells them. And so I didn't like the way they put, they, they did that on their balance sheet where they actually showed growth and they were bragging about their growth, but really that was the form, in the form of selling houses, like I buying, and which means like they buy the house and then they go sell it on their same platform. And I didn't like that because the margin of that was like 1%. Um, 
whereas if you look at their core product. Anyways, Redfin has great product property management tools, great company. Uh, again, more speculative, definitely a tech play and definitely banking on the fact that insurance uh, interest rates are going to stay stagnant or lower for the next three to four years. Uh, Redfin will be an absolute massive winner in that game. I've invested significantly in Amazon. I sold off a lot of my shares in Amazon when it hit 3,500 and it's since retreated and kind of traded sideways for the next, the past six months. I personally feel like the next 12 months or six months even, it's going to go up significantly up to 4,000. But um, I have trimmed my stake in uh, Amazon by about, let's see here, uh, by about 80%. Uh, I was very heavily in, in the Amazon, trimmed it significantly at 3,500. When it dropped below 3,000, I bought more. I don't usually sell stocks. I don't. Uh, because if you sell a stock and you make money on it, and hopefully your profit made money on it, you are going to have to pay taxes on it. So I don't want to pay taxes, and so I usually keep these for the long haul. Uh, I only sell, and I did sell this year significantly when I purchased real estate. For the down payment, I would take you know a lot of the money out and use it for the down payment. Same thing with Google. Google is, uh, I bought them significantly back, let's see here, I bought them significantly in September, actually, when they were down to about 140, well, 1440, and now they're at 1738. They went as high as 1820, uh, and that is because I feel like Google and Facebook ads are where small businesses will come back very strong, and they're going to absolutely push against and leave traditional media in the form of television, uh, newspapers, radio, I think that stuff is going to get left behind. And the easiest place for small businesses to market on is Google and Facebook ads. So I did buy significant amounts of Apple, or sorry, Google, and it's done really well the past few months. And I, I've been in Google since the beat, you know, er, you know, early like, for a long time. But recently, it was in September, I bought quite a bit when they dipped down. Then they had this great report, uh, great uh, quarterly report, and it jumped significantly the past uh, few weeks. Microsoft, big believer in Microsoft. They are dividend stocked, uh, but uh, they're and they're more of a value play in terms of their P.E. ratio being 35. However, I bought them significantly. Let's see what my dollar cost average. Like 204. So I didn't get into this one super, super heavy when it was lower than 200. But uh, it's basically been trying, trading sideways. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook have basically been try, trading sideways for the past like three to five months. And I feel like in the next six months, we're going to see them rebound. Honestly, their stock, the stock is just catching up with itself. It just, they've all grown so much this year. They've got to, it's going to take some time to catch up. Okay. Tesla, I'm invested in Tesla. Uh, not as much as I wish I had been, but they obviously have torn it up this year. I bought significantly before they announced that they were going to go into the S&P 500. I also, uh, before their stock split, I was able to get in the day of, and that was a big jump. So I've participated in those two big jumps and that was is one stock that I move in and move out of because I see some uh, about two to three weeks where they have hype and their stock goes to the roof and then it'll kind of trade sideways for a few months. And so I have kind of swung trade this one and I've used those two big events, the stock split and the S&P 500, 500 inclusion as sort of my uh, two big swing trades on Tesla. Um, all right, Facebook. We've already talked a little bit about Facebook. I've, you know, I have... Basically, not gained a whole lot of money on Facebook. In fact, I'm actually I've lost I think like 0.4 percent. Yeah, because this one since I purchased it, it's basically traded sideways, and so I don't have a lot in it. Let's see here. Yeah, I don't have very much at all, but um, I do have some in Facebook as well. Lemonade. We already talked about Lemonade. It is up substantially the past couple months. Again, very speculative. It is not a value play. It's definitely a growth play in in the belief that it's going to continue to use its AI and to be able to sell insurance to millennials. That's really the, the catch. Etsy. I've been in Etsy since it was under $100, and it has done incredibly well this year. It is an online basically marketplace for uh, little things that people make at home. And with the whole stay at home uh, economy and the whole pandemic happening, people at home making little arts, crafts, and selling them online, Etsy has done an incredible job. They've been included in the S&P 500. And so they are still a growth stock. Their price to earnings ratio is 105. But uh, they've done incredibly well, especially over the course of the past three months uh, when I really came back strong invested more. They, they dipped right when the vaccines came out, where the vaccines uh, were uh, approved and all of that a few months ago. They dipped heavily 
And then I bought very strongly after they dropped, I think, like 20% in a day. I, dr I jumped into Etsy very heavily, bought them at 120, and now they're up to 190. And I feel like they're going to be a, they're going to, you know, obviously they're winners because of the pandemic, but I feel like they're still a long term win. They're going to be, a, it's part of the whole economic transition to technology. And I feel like Etsy will still do well in the future. So definitely a winner because of 2020, but they will, I feel like, continue to do, uh, they're a great company. Okay, so EXPI is another company that I've invested in. Um, this actually, this company is founded in Bellingham, Washington, which is where I live, and uh, so there's a little bit of nostalgia there. But honestly, just an incredible stock. They sell real estate online without the need for a broker. And I bought this stock after it dipped, so it dipped really heavily in October. It was at sixty-one dollars, and it dropped all the way down in the forties. So I dropped, I bought it significantly in the forties, and knowing that it was. The future of real estate, again, this is a speculative play more. Uh, the price to earnings ratio is like 240. But uh, I feel like, number one, they're local. I like that. But they're, they sell, they, the way that they do their brokerage in terms of not needing a real estate agent that is live and in person, the way that they can do their whole, the way they sell homes, I, I love their model. Their business model is great. And um, they're a local company. So I invested quite significantly in them. And now their stock, their, their price is, is well over uh, $70, $80, their price, uh, their share price. All right, so now these ones I'm going to get into now are a little more speculative. These are ones that are definitely um, a little bit of gambling, quote unquote, on. But I've looked at all of their P&Ls. I've looked at their leadership. I've looked at what they're doing. And, and that's the only reason I've invested them. And I'm very much fine with the fact if I lose the money that, you know, so be it. So, okay, so the one, this one is called Mimecast, and it's rare that I invest in a company out of the UK or like out of the US, but I feel like this is a really good security, uh, uh, kind of cybersecurity play, Mimecast, and they've already gone up 35% since I purchased them. So I purchased them around $40, and now they're up around 58. This is not like a super fast growth company, but I feel like they were hurt a little bit by the pandemic, when in reality, I feel it's actually going to be long term is going to help them a lot uh, in terms of just more and more people getting online and needing digital security, et cetera, cybersecurity. So uh, Mimecast has done well. Okay, this other one, Palantir. This is massively speculative. I purchased this at $19, and then it shot up to 30 and I sold off most of my stake. Uh, and then it dipped down to like 24 I bought some more of it. So I've been swing trading this one. I've uh, done very, very well, very fortunate, lucky on this one, like 60%, 70% in the past month uh, up on that. All right, Twilio, great company. So I bought this when it was under $300 a share. Twilio basically, oh, sorry, I didn't really explain what Palantir is. Basically, the reason I invested in Palantir is because I looked what happened with Snowflake and what happened with their IPO and then the way that, that Snowflake was, was valued versus Palantir when they actually do similar stuff. Not exactly the same, but similar stuff. Uh, and so basically, I saw a huge opportunity. I bought in and literally the next day, it went up 20%. Like, it was ridiculous. It's not anything you can count on. It was luck. But like literally within a week, it went up to 30 and from 20 to 30, like 50% up. So I sold off most of my shares, waited for it to come back down to 24 after trader hype, and then bought back in, and now it's at like 27, 28. All right, Twilio. Basically, it's a t texting function uh, that integrates with so many different softwares and platforms to be able to... Uh, utilize technology in the form of text messaging and connecting with your customers that way. So I bought them on their 300, they're now 362. Twilio is a great company. Again, they're still young. They are still um, not super profitable. It's not like they're kicking off billions of dollars, but I feel like this is a very stable company. I really, really Ooh. believe in this company, and I, I look forward to seeing what text texting technology kind of begins to improve. And we actually use Twilio for the gym for our marketing purposes with uh, incoming leads and the lead, the sales funnel. So very, very happy with it. It's been, it's gone up 22% because I bought it under 300. It's now 363. So uh, great stock I, in my opinion. The next one's very speculative. Shift. Uh, this is Shift Technologies, ticker, ticker symbol F, SFT. And they've traded uh, about only about 10% up since I've purchased them. But I'm a big believer in this company because they're used cars, uh, selling them online. They only have a small, very, very small piece of the market compared to like Carvana or these other online uh, used cars 
uh, dealers. So the reason I'm a big believer is because I feel like used cars are going to be very big in the next 10 years as people become more frugal after 2020 and they see a big shock. Same thing happened after like 2008. Everyone gets really frugal and like stops spending money. Like right now the savings rate is the highest it's ever been in the United States. And so I'm a big believer in used cars. You know, I've seen the used car market go gangster bananas in terms of just the cost of the used cars going up. And so I feel like shift is dramatically undervalued. If you compare it, if you compare it to uh, Carvana and these other big players in the used car market. And so I feel like they will do well. Again, very speculative. They've been trading sideways for a while, but I believe like Lemonade, they'll eventually be recognized. And they're super small cap. So small cap stocks, basically small cap means like small valuation. Uh, this one's only $750 million. So like, it's not a very big company compared to like Apple, which is $2 trillion, right? So uh, the, it's the law of large numbers in terms of a large company is not usually going to double their market size. They're not going to double the stock price. It's very difficult. Law of m large numbers. Whereas a small company can, you can get massive returns like Palantir. It went from 20 to 30, like 50% in a matter of just a week. Uh, that's not going to happen to Apple or Google or anyone like that. So these small cap stocks are, they can grow really fast, but they can also go to zero very, very fast. Uh, and so they're more speculative. I do have uh, significant shares in Apple. I think we all know what Apple does, so I'm not going to go into that. And then uh, the only recovery plays I bought were BP and Chevron. And I bought them when they were at their very lowest a few months ago. So I'm up about 25, 30% on both of those. I'm not a big fan of them long term. I don't think we're going to be using fossil fuels very much in 10 to 20 years. Excuse me. But they're great re recovery plays and kind of balance out my portfolio that's, that is very, very tech driven. All right. The next company is Fastly. I purchased one, this one uh, a couple months ago when they dropped down to, it was like in the 60s. Yeah, like high 60s. Yeah, 60s is when I purchased in. And it was because after, basically on the report, they basically stated how much they were dependent on TikTok, and so their 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 stock price won't drop from 120 down to down into the 60s, like literally almost half. So I purchased quite a bit then. It's now recovered significantly, so I'm doing really well on this one. The stock price is now 97. Uh, they basically do a lot of SDK stuff with when it comes to online platforms, social media stuff. So TikTok was a big customer that they lost. It was a big draw on their stock price, and so that's when I purchased in. Uh, and so, okay, I'm just going to go through these other ones really quickly. So Hylion, very, very speculative. Hydrogen play in terms of creating a, uh, a semi-truck is what they're working on, right, to basically convert an existing truck into, you know, hydrogen-powered, uh, natural gas. They're, you know, kind of that alternative fuel source, and they're working mostly right now on semi-trucks. I purchased this one once it dove down a bunch, and I don't expect this one to do super well. Uh, I've, this is, the only, I think, one of my only stocks I've lost a, a little bit of money on because I purchased it, I think, at like $20 cost average. Now it's at 17 But again, little tiny part of the, part, part of the portfolio. Uh, NEO, done really well on this one. This is a, an electric car manufacturer over in China. Kind of balances out my Tesla portfolio. Um, and that one's been up and down. I've been day trading that one. Not day trading, swing trading that one a little bit because it got hyped up at around the 50s. Mid-50s, I sold off, let it drop down to 40 and purchased back in a little bit. Um, all right, Dropbox, I've purchased this one, very speculative play because it could potentially be purchased. There's a chance it could be bought out. And so I bought a little bit of Dropbox. Also, the other kind of speculative play that I've bought into is Tattooed Chef. Tattooed Chef is a company that is, uh, has always been doing private label for Trader Joe's, Walmart, other companies, and is now going creating their own private uh, brand. And so I feel like their valuation, the whole way that they've been valued in the past will be scrapped and they'll be valued at a much higher valuations. So I hope, I hope that was helpful for some of you. And the biggest reason why I'm so invested in the stock market right now and have continued to really educate myself in that arena is because I do feel like about three to five years when so many of our franchisees have grown their businesses, they're more established, they're really becoming profitable. They're going to want to be looking for that next avenue of investment, whether it be starting their own location, a second or third location for Augusta, but also having the more passive approach of stock market trading, real estate, and diversifying their portfolio as they begin to invest. And so I really feel an obligation to learn these things, be able to look at you know which companies are doing well, and 
uh, analyze these things and help them learn these things too. And so this has been a great learning opportunity for me. And again, I don't think that you should go through all those, those companies, just invest in them because of I did. Uh, 2020 has been an awesome year. Uh, we, like I said, 94 plus percent in, in terms of returns. I don't expect those next year. If I can get 20 to 30 percent, I'm very confident I can do that by having a balance of risk stocks that are a uh, small cap as well as blue chip companies. But again, you got to remember, you know, as a function of portfolio and, and net worth, not all my money is wrapped up in the stock market. Like I have real estate. We have 10 units of real estate, uh, 10, uh, apartment comp, like 10, uh, rentals properties that, uh, we rent in and I have mass, most of my, my net worth and what I focus on is Augusta Lawn Care, my businesses. And so what I, I invest in the stock market is not like going to hurt me if I lose it. So keep that in mind. I don't think you should go in there and just willy-nilly throw money in just because I said it or some other person on YouTube said it uh, or Jim Cramer said it on Mad Money. Like uh, I'm not a big fan of doing that. Like if you don't invest, if you can't analyze the numbers, if you can't make decisions on these companies and really know the fundamentals of trading uh, and fundamentals of of stock market investing. Uh, I'm not a big fan of day trading. I'm, I'm absolutely against someone just moving money in short term. Like that's all gambling in my opinion. And yes, some people do well. And 2020 has been a year where the trader has won. But long term traders do not do well. Long term traders lose money. I do not do any sort of options. All right, so I know there's gonna be questions in, in, in the Q&A. So let me just clear this up. I don't do any options. Those are calls and puts where you're basically gambling if the company's going to go up or down. And yes, some people know, uh, but I, I really feel like unless you have inside information, you're probably, you're literally just guessing with everybody else. And so I don't do any calls or puts in the form of options. I don't do, I don't invest in Bitcoin. All right. Uh, the reason for that is because there are just too many question marks and I cannot confidently know where it's going. There is not a, t a stated value that I can look back and, and have a track record of history. All I see when I see Bitcoin is going way up and way up and way down and up and down. And like there's, it's, it's incredibly volatile and I don't feel like there's any fundamentals. There's nothing I can go and lay my hands on. There's nothing that's there. And so that maybe I'm just old fashioned, you know, maybe, you know, everyone right now with, has invested in Bitcoin. They have all the leverage in the world to say how stupid I am for saying that those things because Bitcoin has gone up so much in the past, you know, four or five months. And so, you know, kudos to them. They've tripled their money in the past few months. Uh, but however, there's nothing holding it back from crashing in the next few months. It's not like I have a, a statement of cash flows or a quarterly reports of a company that's actually producing revenue and so, and producing cash flow. So I do not invest in Bitcoin. It's something I do watch. And if it dives again, maybe I'll buy back in a little bit, uh, but it's never going to be a big part of my portfolio uh, simply because currently I don't feel like it's strong enough. And I do feel like there's going to be some more bumps in the road. I do think that though, that, you know, traditional currencies are going to get disrupted uh, long term. I feel like gold is going to become a bigger, bigger play when it comes to uh, currency. And so uh, this whole pandemic has proven that gold has gone way up. Bitcoin has gone way up. And as the you know, U.S. dollar becomes more leveraged in the form of debt, they, these are all things that you got to keep in mind. But right now, I am not going to invest in a un, uh, in, in a in, in a, a, a piece of metal, basically gold. Uh, I'm not going to do that right now. It's an unproductive asset. It does not create cash flow. It does not create anything. Uh, and it is a piece of metal. You're basically, a, it's, it's unproductive. It doesn't give me a dividend. It doesn't give any profits kicking off. It's not doing R and D and growing and expanding. It just sits there. And so, uh, do I feel like my opinions on that will change if we have a correction in those asset classes? Probably. And I'll probably get a little bit of you know, diversification in those areas. Uh, and again, right now me saying that i you know, people would say I'm stupid because they look at the past five months. What they don't see is the people who bought in in 2018 in Bitcoin when it was, you know, 15, 16, 17,000, and then it went down to four, five, 6,000. So, you know, um, it all depends, you know, everyone online will jump around the next hype thing, the next, ne the next stock that's going to go up 500%, the next Tesla, uh, they're all over that. And, you know, kudos to them. Like, have fun. If you enjoy that, if that's a game for you, great, but I'm not investing in that sort of thing. I only invest in companies I really believe in for the long-term growth potential, or I really believe in because they have s solid balance sheets that are undervalued when it comes to their PE ratio, when I compare them against their cohort uh, competitors and of their cohort. 
expert and in their industry. So that's kind of my two cents. Hopefully that was helpful. I know it was a longer video, but if you're investing in stocks and things like that, it probably was interesting to you. So thank you so much, everyone. You've been listening to Business Bootcamp Podcast. I'm Mike Andes. We'll see you next time.